Hey, it's Howard Neller. Welcome back to another edition of Listening Chair. We're glad to have you. We're here in downtown Manhattan in New York at Spring Studios for Marantz's 70th anniversary celebration. I was here last night, we had a great rooftop party, and we're here today and we're gonna get a tour from the Marantz historian of some really cool vintage Marantz gear, which tells the story of Marantz as a company. So I'm going to go over the history a little bit of the brand and with that showing some of uh, our heritage products here at the House of Marantz today, okay. 70th anniversary. So uh, that's a big number, 70. And it's 70 years of history, really. So um, let's get started. Um, 1953, this guy, Saul Marantz. Here's his picture of the early 1930s when he was at school. He had a car stereo and he wasn't satisfied with the sound. So that car stereo he modified and he did all kinds of things with it. But eventually he decided to create a unit really, the audio console F like we, um, we know it now, or the Model 1 later was remodeled, uh, well redesigned and also renamed Model 1, which he listened to a lot of records. He listened to a lot of like um, uh, 78 RPM records. Okay. And those had different equalizations. Right. And, uh, different with curves. Right, right. So, and uh, with uh, these uh, switches, he could like put or listen to every record of every manufacturer he had at home. So, he started selling these as well. He started giving them out to friends, and it was a huge hit. He built these in uh, his basement in Kew Gardens, okay. five miles down the block. And um, yeah, really a nice unit. And he had so much success with this here in New York. He had to hire chief engineer, which was Sid Sidney Smith. Uh, he came from Radio Capsman in Chicago, and okay. um, he redesigned this unit. was rebranded Model 1. And um, so they started a company, right? They started the Marantz Company. They okay. were first based briefly in Manhattan. Then they were based out of uh, Long Island City in Queens. And they had a couple of locations, mainly because the, the space, the factory was too small, and they had to upgrade because there was so much demand. So uh, then we continue into the 1950s. So uh, 1958 was an important year because stereo rolled around the corner in 1958. Okay. Um, and a model called Model 7C was released. We don't okay. have one on display today, but this is the Model 7T, which looks almost the same. Only these uh, little knobs were Bakelite and not aluminum. Okay. And it had a black switch and uh, some tubes in the back. This was a later unit, so they re revised the Model 7C into the Model 7T. And um, so they had this Model 70 stereo preamplifier, right? And you could, they also uh, designed the Model 9. This was all Sid Smith's um, work creations, yeah. yes. Um, so the Model 9 is really interesting because it, it made use of the porthole, like we call it today. It wasn't called that back in the day, right. but now we call it that. You, it was a test meter, really. So these ha they have, there are four EL34s in here, so push-pull. 70 watts RMS into 8 ohms. Okay. And um, you could really test these, so put bias tests, so bias your tubes in the unit. So you didn't need any, any tube tests, any, tube, any test equipment, any scopes. No, you could, as end user, you could, okay. like behind this, if I get the cover open, yes, there, there are go. bias um, trimmers. So these trimmers, you go in with a screwdriver and you test with the meter and if they're correctly biased, they're on this uh, mark, right. which was really revolutionary in that time to have something you, um, to have something an uh, end user can do. This is an important unit, the Model 10B. Um, initially, uh, three years of uh, production uh, and also uh, designer costs. Um, originally, there was a Model 10, which had two less, two knobs less here. Okay. In, um, on the unit, but they had some problems with the back. They had some filters that were too close to the tubes. They were they got too hot, so they redesigned it. It was an expensive unit to produce, and that almost bankrupted Marantz because, um, yeah, it was six hundred fifty dollars for one in 1964, and it was like putting a hundred dollar bill in every box. They were so expensive. And, Where was uh, the company located at this point? At this point, they were still in Long Island City, okay. uh, on Broadway in Long Island City. So there were around 6,000 of them built back in the day. And this drove, this unit really drove them into the hands of Superscope, which we're going to continue here. Okay. So Superscope, uh, California-based uh, California company, 
Um, Tushinsky brothers were the CAOs. They kept Mer Saul Morantz and uh, Sidney Smith as chief engineers and uh, the president. Okay. But um, in starting 1968, because of uh, like mixed opinions um, with um, Saul Morantz and then the Tushinsky brothers, he resigned and he uh, uh, retired from the company. And, but they still used some of his designs and some of Smith's designs for, this is the second receiver, for example, this is the Model 19, which was uh, made in 1969. Okay. And uh, it's uh, revolution, it's a design Sidney Smith already came up with the Model 18, which was the first receiver. Looks a little bit different, it's a little bit more powerful, this okay. one. What is nice about this piece, still high quality, full aluminum knobs. You have, this is a new invention of the day. This is the gyro touch tuning, which is which moves the needle very precisely around, and uh, it is no uh, rotary um, dial. Rotary dial, right? It's just a really precise piece, which is connected to a cable and uh, an analog tuning uh, tuning cable. Right. And you had the scope. This is a um, an, yeah, a small telephone scope, which mm -hmm. is incorporated in the unit. And you can, uh, it has three purposes. The first purpose is high candy. You see the music playing. But the second purpose is the tuning. So instead of having tuning meters, you have the scope. And if it's perfectly in the middle, you're tuning in the right in the station. Right. And then multipad is uh, for the placement of the antenna, if the antenna is good or not. Moran's did that in with his later units too. So there were a lot of units with scopes. Then we have uh, 1974, which Dawson Handley built this one. This is the 510M, made in uh, Sun Valley, California. Um, and one of the last true power amplifiers which were made in the US. Okay. Um, it uses a cooling tunnel, so there's a huge fan at the back. And um, it cools a tunnel of transistors. Okay. Uh, this was used in sound studios and, well, more professional use. Really? They call it professional series too. So then we continue with uh, the unit 4400. So um, Superscope contracted people in Japan, uh, Standard Radio Corporation, and they rebranded. So they bought a company and they turned it into Moran's Japan. And these were made in Japan. Um, this was so, during the era of the monster receivers, correct? Right. So this is 1974. Power so in TH, THD, power, right? Yeah. So this is two times 125 watts uh, stereo and, wow. two and uh, four, uh, four times 50 watts. Um, it's a nice unit, it also has a scope, has a gyro touch tuning, and it has a uh, possibility to hook up a uh, wide remote control, one of the first ones. Okay. okay. We continue into the 1980s. Philips took over the company in 1980, so first European part of uh, Superscope and then okay. also the American part later. Uh, and they uh, hired Kenny Shiwata. Uh, he was a uh, brand ambassador, I would say. Um, from the 1980s up into the 2000s. And then here we have some very cool stuff. This is like 1983. Okay. So um, this is the first CD player Philips made. Philips made it together um, uh, with uh, Sony. So they did together the compact disc player. And actually, this is a CD100 rebranded with Moran's because they were owner back then. Right. And you see, they have the description of the unit uh, actually printed on the unit. It says, this CD63 compact disc player is the equipment which incorporates a new optical sound play system utilizing laser array. Really interesting. And you see also the huge laser unit, which is in the CDM0 by Philips. Um, yeah. And it was reissued in the 2000s here with Kenny Shiwata Signature Edition. Okay. It came in black and it came also in the same color, um, silver. Then uh, I, want, I just want to go briefly over yeah. this. They, um, they incorporated again the porthole. This is a CD player as well, 2000 CD player. And they use this as a track, so elapsed time. And also the, um, yeah, uh, the, the minutes and the number um, of the track. That's Media information, play. right. Right. And then they incorporated it again. Here as a VU meter. So this is MA9S2, which is a, a reissue like in the style of Model 9. When would this have been? This was uh, this was in 2002. Okay. So like almost uh, 20 years now. Yeah, 21 years. Okay. Um, and then this is also again this is the preamplifier that would go with it, and uh, also with like volume, you, volume information, the source and stuff. It's okay. There. And then uh, Moran's went also into like AV equipment back in that day. So they had beamers, they had VCRs, but they also had these uh, like. Uh, 
component, really a center also to put video into that. And it had an, a built-in intern tuner, and the gyro touch, the gyro touch tuning came back here. Right. Um, so, but this is now digital. This isn't with the cable anymore. It's a digital um, way of tuning, and that's really where we're left off. These are our current products right now, which are over there. Okay. Um, so, both AV equipment in the front, and then at the back we have the Model 30 and the SACD 30N, which is a network CD player. Okay, come in black, but also in silver. Uh, so for every customer, there's like a, for every taste, right? There's an answer, right? Well, thank you so much for taking us uh, through a tour of this super interesting uh, Marantz equipment. Uh, talking about Marantz history. If we want to find out more about Marantz history, where can we go? So uh, I'm actually only on Instagram. I'm on at Marantz History. It's very simple, and you can find me there. I post um, I post videos, photos of vintage equipment, and I also go and visit my followers, Marantz History on tour, etc. So if you want to check it out, that's the place to be. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.